and you hear ambulances and you say, that, that's probably someone dying in front of them. And I'm like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I've lost so many people I love in that way, you know? It's just, it terrifies me. I've overdosed numerous times. If I didn't wake up tomorrow, what would I really be missing? It's 10.45 on a Tuesday morning and we're here in downtown Ottawa. My producer Ryan and I have been walking around speaking with people who use fentanyl. We wanted to get a sense of what the opioid crisis looks like in cities like ours and within minutes we got a first hand look. One man on the ground struggling to survive, another injecting himself. We came across scenes like those pretty commonly while we were gathering this story. It's shocking, but for Jesse Curry, it's just part of daily life. All my teachers were like, you're meant to be a graphic designer, you're meant to be a photographer, you're meant to be a dancer and a singer. I was always in the plays and I did all that kind of stuff. We met her near a supervised injection site. She's keen to tell her story, so we go for a walk. I wanted to know about her life before all of this. She tells me she's an artist at heart, took courses in fashion, graphic design, loves photography. When people say like opioid crisis, like how do you think of that? Oh my God. I've been out here since the beginning, well not the beginning of it, but the, the worst parts. Homeless, nowhere to go for three, almost three years now. With a, lot, a great loss of people in my life that I loved very much. So how many people have you lost to, to hundreds, overdoses? Hundreds, hundreds. It doesn't end. It's actually really sad. Friends, yeah, she's lost a lot of those. But Jessie's also got a really young daughter. She's about seven years old. Hasn't been able to speak to her in years. And Jessie says she was a full-blown addict when her daughter was born. Doctors and medications helped keep that addiction in check. But after a while, it all fell apart. And after the fourth, fifth year of her, of her being on the earth with me, um, I had a moment of PTSD where everything kind of fell apart in my life and I was remembering past things that I shouldn't have remembered, but um, then I turned to a break with my, as a mother, and that break turned into her never coming back. So her never coming back was in my mind, and I, I started using other drugs, experimenting with meth, and then, and then experimenting with uh, shooting meth, and then experimenting with uh, all this other shit, and then taking pills and drinking. It was all the things I could get my hands on. As long as I was numb, I was fine. And so smoking it became the first way to do it, but then I started injecting it, and then every time I injected it, I found myself either passed out somewhere, being molested, raped, robbed, or almost frozen to death, um, or in some com comparable position. Like, that's traumatic. You, you, you wake up from being passed out on, on fentanyl. Like, what goes through your mind in that moment of, of becoming conscious again? Every time I've woken up, I've been with that person that was hurting me. So it was like a fear of like, how the fuck am I going to survive this? Devastating stories. They're tough to hear. But Ryan and I, we heard a lot of them. And for us, it really helped put faces to all of those numbers. Big picture, across Canada in 2016, opioids were killing about eight people daily. In just the first three months of this year, we're already seeing an average 21 people dying every single day across the country. Is that guy all right? All right. You sure? Yeah. The next person that agrees to speak with us is someone that you might walk by at your local park. Jason P. LeBlanc. Loves hanging out by the water, likes to read. He's got a community of friends out here on the streets. And they all try to look out for each other. We go down to Strathcona Park and we talk, watch the river, ducks, stuff like that. Guys like Jason, they have survived when hundreds of their peers have died. He's been on the streets on and off since he was 13. A couple nights ago, he had to sleep in a dumpster. Before that, it was underneath someone's front porch. Can you talk to me about the first time you ever did fentanyl? Like, wh what made you want to try it? Uh, I, was in, I was in detox in Windsor, and I was doing um, Oxycontin during that whole escapade and uh, I, I needed to get off it 
And the guy in the detox station had, had uh, some patches. And I said, let me tell you one. It, it was a 100 mil microgram patch. I did it, and uh, I just remember waking up in the hospital. I was sitting on the toilet, did it, and woke up in the hospital. Have you lost a lot of people to fentanyl overdoses then? Have you lost a lot of that community? I lost, uh, a, I guess you could say, a common law wife. I lived with her for a couple of years. Uh, to overdose, to fentanyl? Yeah. And it just, uh, it, it's a hole that I can't fill up. I, I, every day I wake up, I, I, I can't not think about it. What goes through through your mind when you when you see people using fentanyl these days? Uh, um, there goes really there goes another one. You know, you hear ambulances and you say that, that's probably someone dying of fentanyl. five bucks. That's all it takes to get a hit of something that you might never wake up from. And that's the thing, both Jesse and Jason, they know that they're playing with fire. Every person we spoke to knows the dangers really well. Have you had any close calls yourself? I, I've overdosed numerous times. How many? Um... Let's say in, uh, around 20. You had close calls? Yeah. Two. Can, Can you tell me about those? Can you describe them? The first one um, was at a buddy's house, and I think they narcaned me about seven times. It was frightening. All I could, all I remember is like hearing everybody, but I couldn't move. And everybody was just fighting, and I was like, what the fuck is going on? And I'm like, I can't. So I, I reached over and I saw another Narcan, so I Narcan myself. What goes through your mind every time you're about to use? Is there a worry there that this might be the last time? It, 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 there's no worry because it, 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 it takes away the pain from things that have happened in my life, right? And I don't feel it no more. And it just goes away. And, I don't feel it. Why go back to it? Have you ever been dope sick? If you don't use in the streets and you're dope sick, you're vulnerable and you're not safe. You're basically going to be on the ground twitching, convulsing. You're not going to have the strength to move. You're going to want to vomit. You're going to be shitting and pissing your pants. Pardon my French. I'm sorry. But the illness is so much greater than the flu. It's like, it's an emotional wreck as well because you're sober. So you're thinking about all the reasons why you got numb in the first place. Are you afraid of not waking up from, no. from one of those? At I mean, point, no. th you've mentioned so many people that, because you've, you've, you've had people overdose, right? Asking. I mean, but it's are, so sad to say that. But I haven't heard from my family in almost four years. Like, what do I have to live for, really? We really didn't expect to hear that. I think when, when we set out on this piece, we maybe expected to hear that people were afraid of the drug that's been killing so many. To hear them say they don't care if they die, I think that, that answer was a real shock. But for a, a lot of people living through this, it's, it's not surprising at all. Cheap drugs, high stakes. Everybody gets the thought of feeling, oh, it's really strong, but it won't take me out. You know, I've done this, that, and the other. But that's actually a sales pitch, you know, along with the names they'll give it, like, you know, death row or nuclear bomb or, you know, stupid shit like that. So. It really opened my eyes, like, the best sales talk is basically if someone dies on your product and everybody finds out about it, because everybody wants to do that strong. You just think it's not going to happen to you, you know? Sean LeBlanc is a guy that never thought that he'd be finding himself being one of the faces of the opioid crisis. Never thought he'd be into injection drugs either, but just when life was looking really good, things took a sharp turn. So I left home at 13, a uh, very abusive family situation. I eventually put myself through high school, um, worked for a couple of years, hitchhiked to California, came back, but applied as a mature student at a university back home, back east. Got in and my partner um, 
in second year, she passed away when she was seven months pregnant. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. I lost both her and obviously the baby to be. And um, I just basically turned into the person that didn't want to feel anything. And I started drinking and then very slowly in the opiates, or really not that slowly actually. I found the opiates would allow me to forget without having to be dying every morning of a hangover. He's clean now. He's on a methadone program. And for the last decade, he's been an advocate for users. He started a user support group with five other people. Everyone from that group is now dead, except for him. And that's in part because you can get fentanyl anywhere. If you want to go get fentanyl, like, is it, is it everywhere? Is it? It's five minutes from here, no problem. Easy, easy peasy. It's easier to get than weed in this community. It's easier to get than beer in this community. Easier to get fentanyl than weed. Uh, yes, and beer and probably cigarettes too, for sure. From where we walk near the center, probably three or four people I could score off of if I was so inclined. It's not just that you can get it anywhere, it's what you're getting because it's not pharmaceutical fentanyl that we're talking about anymore. The pandemic unleashed a wave of demand. Illegal manufacturing, that went into overdrive and they created a deadly cocktail. I tested one of mine last week and it had 3% fentanyl and 97% unknown. <laughs> so you, you have no idea what you're putting in your range. Guys like Jason have been taking their drugs to the Sandy Hill Community Health Center. There are fewer than a dozen drug testing machines in Canada, and Ottawa has one of them. If you're inside, you're gonna see lineups of people waiting to use it. And those machines, they've been working so well that even more of them are on the way. So this is a, a scatter Raman spectrometer. So what's great about this machine is if people are coming in and they think it's fentanyl, we can say yes or no, this is fentanyl, or this is something completely different. So this is um, a sample of fentanyl that we're just gonna test. So this is showing us that we're gonna have anywhere between 73, 74% of erythritol, so like a binding agent, 16% um, fentanyl, which is pretty high, and 9% um, Romazolam. Most users would be pretty happy with a 16% um, fentanyl in, in their drugs because that's why they're, they're buying these drugs. Although 9% um, benzo is, is very high. So that's something that probably most people don't want. Benzos are, are quite uh, dangerous themselves. Dangerous because anti-overdose medications like naloxone, which every user has with them, these don't work on benzodiazepines. And so knowing the ingredients list, that might just change your decision to use it. But there is another factor to the rising death count. It's how people are taking it. Smoking fentanyl. It's easier, it hits the system harder, and it solves a problem for injection drug users. Because the high from the new drug cocktails, it comes on strong, but it doesn't last as long as it used to. So some injection drug users are having to inject up to a dozen times a day. What happens then is you run out of usable veins, and so you turn to smoking. And since you can't smoke fentanyl in a supervised consumption site, you go into the community to do it it's turned smoking into the most common way of overdosing. Here's what that looks like in cities like Ottawa. 145 opioid deaths last year. We're on a pace to reach a higher death toll this year. And if you zoom out, you're gonna see that since 2018, overdose deaths in Ontario have doubled. And across the province, more than half of those people had been smoking it. What does it take to to end this opioid crisis, to, to reverse this? I think a lot of diverse voices, you know, we need to hear more from our indigenous community and the different healings they have. Uh, I think we need more safer supply. I think we need safer supply that uses the type of drugs that people want, like pharmaceutical um, heroin and whatnot. Um, we need new treatments. Most treatments now are still absent in space and that isn't helping everybody. Um, and we just need more opportunity. Like when I was homeless or marginally housed, you know, you don't, feel that great you know that it's, it's a really rough situation to be in and it's very easy in that situation to just say hey I'm gonna try this drug and you know at least get a night off from all the drama that's going on around me so housing employment 
um, opportunities for people that use drugs, uh, management opportunities for people who use drugs. Oh. What do you need to get back on your feet? Housing, support, and food. That's it. On a personal level, like how are those linked for you? Well, I have a little girl, and I need consistency in my life. I need to sleep. I need to eat. If, I do, if I'm outside, I'm not sleeping. You've got to be an idiot to sleep out here because you're going to get robbed and hurt, like I said. Housing would give me the, the chance to just sit down, lay on my, or sit on my couch and open up a book and read and, and then sit down and enjoy a book. The safety of home? Yeah, and, and the, the feeling that they have to, this is mine, you know? I spoke to a lot of frontline workers for this story, and they say the pandemic, it really put us behind. And when addiction services were put on hold, they lost a lifeline to their clients. And you might not think this has anything to do with you, but in one way or another, it does. Because there's a social cost. All those overdoses, they represent people, lost potential, broken families. And there's the immediate cost, a huge strain on our already fragile healthcare system. But healthcare workers say until all governments start to see housing, social services, and mental health supports as pieces of the same puzzle, it's going to be a long time before we catch up. <laughs>